A top-ranked matchup for Texas baseball is nigh. Softball series against OSU has gone by, and this show is for the alumni. All this and more on this special alumni edition of College Crossfire. We're talking football, football, a little more football, and maybe even some football. Stay tuned, it's College Crossfire. Welcome to College Crossfire. Thanks for joining us for our first show of the fall semester. I'm your new host, Jeff Barker, replacing Garrett Green. Excited to be here, guys. for first time out of the field. I'm really excited. I'm ready to go one and zero. I'm going to 15,000. 15,000. Last week, but you know what? Texas is going to win. Texas is going to win. You know why? Because OU sucks. That's why. You know what? You know, you know what? what? OU, see, we have a hook'em sign, but they don't have a sign, so I'm gonna make one for you. The last thing you want is having an Asian guy make a hand sign for you. This OU, it's going down. It's going down. <laughs> it's going down. <laughs> OU sucks. That's it. <laughs> what are those? coming back for that 2021 MVP. He's better than Josh Allen. He's better than Megan Rayfield. He's not better than Mahomes. I can't say that. Well, well Justin oh. Tucker, give him his 99 rating in Madden. Ceiling is the roof. There is no roof, so they have a pretty high ceiling. The SAT or the AC? <laughs> let's, let's really see how. That's enough talk. Let's talk. everyone, I am Drew Jacob, and as always, I am your host for College Crossfire. Let's make the rounds. On first base, representing the class of 2021, we have Daniel. Daniel, how does it feel to be back? Uh, it's, you know, it's been two weeks or three, I forgot. I, know. I, was, I was back here to, like, during the semester, but it's nice to be on the first base. I haven't been here ever, so. Well, a moment's break from your gaze is an eternity past. That said, moving on to second base, also representing the class of 2021, we have Thomas. Thomas, how are we feeling today? We're doing good. I'm hoping to do a little better than uh, freshman year. The last time I was on, I, don't, I didn't even remember that Trinidad and Tobago question. I'm kind of convinced that y'all just like cherry picked that, that stat. I don't know. I thought what would you have said? It's, it's an island. I would have said the exact number, and I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> Excellent, and that brings us nicely to our third base, Jeff, representing the class of 2015. Jeff, how are we doing? Good. You guys are making me feel old. 21, 21, and then, <laughs> did and then showing that, that archive footage. I mean, did, did y'all like, ride horses on campus when you were here? It, it, we did, yeah. and we, we were talking about how Uber wasn't even around when I first got to campus. So, <laughs> Crazy. so everything's making me feel old, but really happy to be back. Absolutely. Everyone, we're happy to have y'all back. Sorry, Texas's 100-play spring game has come and gone, and while some of the results were promising, if I could keep it 100 for a second, I'm not sure that was necessarily the case across the board. But I will leave that up to our esteemed analyst to decide. So, panel, what player or, you, or group do you think had the most notable performance at the spring game, be they over or underwhelming? And on this one, we are starting with Daniel. Well, I think the quarter, uh, I wouldn't, would have wanted to see more out of Malik Murphy uh, because I think he's a very important depth um, chess piece for this team in, in, in that quarterback room. But um, <clears throat> focusing on the quarterback, I was more impressed with Quinn Ewers than I was with Cut Hudson Card. Um, yes, Ewers threw an interception, but that's something you, you, know, you might see quite common for a freshman who's been here for a couple months. Um, Hudson Card, I didn't see that drastic step from last season to this season. You know, there was a lot of safe passes, um, a lot of holding the ball on for too long, and there wasn't a lot of wow factor with Hudson Card, whereas in Quinn Ewers, he had that beautiful touchdown pass. Very, I, I forget who it is, who, who, what, how long it was, but it was a beautiful touchdown pass that every Texas fan has seen on Twitter right now. Um, and I, I feel like out of those, I, I understand that Hudson Card is playing with the uh, one, one offense and Ewers with the twos, but um, I feel like this will be a much closer competition coming into the fall 
and I won't be surprised if Ewers is QB1. Absolutely. You know, even before the spring game, felt like the hype machine was completely behind Ewers. So I would say regardless of what groups they're playing with in the spring game, it's got to kind of feel like his job to lose at this point. Yeah. That said, though, we're on to Thomas next. So I want to look at the, the running back room. I was actually really impressed by Jonathan Brooks and his performance in the game. Obviously, Roshan Johnson had that great run, and we've seen a lot from Roshan over the years. But Brooks only saw a little bit of last year, and you know, behind Bijan, to keep his legs fresh, you're going to need to see a lot of guys. So I really like what I saw to Brooks. I would have liked to see more from Keelan Robinson. However, I think some of that's maybe... You know, Sark's not wanting to divulge too much. I think they probably are going to have a lot of trick plays with his speed. He had that one nice run kind of to the, the edge of the end zone. They said he was down short. But that was about all we saw from him. Absolutely. You know, Bijan, as great as he may be, it becomes clear last year he can't do it all himself. You're going to need to see depth in that running back room. And that said, though, Jeff, we are on to you next. Thomas mentioned not trying to give away too much from Sark's standpoint. He said that it was admittedly going to be vanilla, which – I mean, I think everyone was trying not to drink the Kool-Aid <laughs> with Quinn Ewers because you mentioned the, the hype machine. Mm -hmm. And then he threw that pass, and I was like, <laughs> <It's over. laughs> how can you not? Yeah. And I was listening to the LHN broadcast, and even Kenny Vaccaro said to Mike yeah. Griffin, so they're going back and forth about it, don't think too much into it. And Kenny V just goes, he, he said some of the effect of like, not everybody can do that, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> not everybody yeah. can make that pass. Yeah. Um, so I, th I think both, the, both those quarterbacks impressed, and I think that's kind of what Sark wanted was he didn't want anyone to come away with any – drastic, uh, I guess, takes one way or the other on either guy. So they both played well. We kind of got what we expected from Quinn Ewers, that, that gunslinger play where everyone was like, oh, my God, jaw drop, you know, kind of throw um, on that touchdown pass. And then with Hudson Card, we kind of saw the safe. But I think this is going to come down to the offensive line. And I'm not going to say in the yeah. spring game that they underwhelmed necessarily, but there is so much skill talent for Texas that if the offensive line doesn't get it together and, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they don't stay healthy, these seven freshmen coming in in the summer aren't what we think they're going to be, at least not early on, then Texas could be in trouble, and it could be one of those years where we go, gosh, I mean, they wasted Jordan Whittington's last year, probably Bijan's last year, probably Roshan's last year, um, and then all the other guys that have a receiver. Yeah. And this is something we've said a lot, unfortunately, about great players who have come through Texas in the last 10 years. But as you said, the skill, posi the skill position players did impress similarly. All three of you are impressed with your answers. <laughs> Great work all around. <laughs> that said, yes. Jeff, you will be getting the three on oh, this one. What? Thomas and yes. Daniel, though, you guys will be tying, getting two each. Oh, Stunning. Shouldn't have given you the fist bump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much like Texas weather, Texas baseball this season has been ever-changing and unpredictable. After a pretty bleak turn of events in consecutive games against Kansas State and the Air Force Academy, the Longhorns have reversed their fortunes to the tune of a five-game winning streak, where they recently seemed on the verge of losing their ranking altogether they're now glean they're now gearing up for a top 10 series matchup this weekend so panel it's texas versus oklahoma state let's keep it simple who you got winning the series and on this one we're starting with thomas so we were talking about this a little bit beforehand but this series is coming down to friday night first of all i just want to say i think oklahoma state wins this series but if texas doesn't win on friday night with Boo. pete hansen pitching i think they get swept Oof. the bullpen of texas is so um, has been struggling so much this season. The bats are really hot, but the Oklahoma State pitching is good. So if you can't win that Friday night game, Saturday, Sunday are going to be tough. But overall, I like Oklahoma State winning this 2-1. to one. Absolutely. You know, when you're playing a team as talented and as high quality as Oklahoma State, you need to take that first game, really set the tone, or else, yeah, I mean, Texas could be in danger. That said, though, Jeff, we're on to you next. I think Thomas kind of said it, but both of these teams come in with similar pitching staff situations, at least starting rotations. We have Pete Hansen and Justin Campbell. I think that matchup is going to be huge, too. I actually totally agree with Thomas on that one. Whoever wins that one sets the tone and, and I guess kind of gets that, that monkey off their back of like, hey, no pressure now. We won with our ace. And now you have two pitchers coming in for each team after that where it's sort of a toss-up. Like, Texas, we don't know what we're going to get from Tristan Stevens. It's either been really good or not so great. Lucas Gordon's been solid, but still, he's not all that experienced. So I'm going to take Texas just because it is at home at the dish. That place is going to be electric. I think the weather's supposed to be decent. So should be great crowds, and the bats are hot. So That's what the Texas. bats have stayed hot. And, you know, the start, like the ace is the rotation. These guys have been great. But mm -hmm. once you get past that into your more your de the depth of the bullpen, it's been feast or famine for Texas. For and sure. you really just cannot afford a famine when you're playing a team as good as Oklahoma <laughs> State. Daniel, rounding this one out with you. It all comes down to Tristan Stevens. And he struggled on paper, but real realistically, he's a contact pitcher. And most of the times that he, he got blown out, 
all of a lot of the hits during those outings, the expected batting average of those hitted balls are really low. It just it just found the weird part in the, on the field, and the wind is blowing the right way on Saturday. If it's blowing out, it's gonna be a very tough, very tough uh, a day for the pitching staff. And then you go to Lucas Gordon, who's probably gonna go six innings at most. So that if Tristan Stevens can go long, it's gonna be a nice weekend. If he can't, then you ha you have to throw in a lot of the bullpen for the last two games. And like Thomas said, the bullpen is. Shaky at best. You know, this reminds me, there was an earlier skid in the season, uh, a Texas Tech game where Texas had to go very deep into the bullpen, and you could just see they weren't quite right for, gosh, it feels like an entire week after. So, yeah, it's going to be a big deal this Friday, what exactly happens. Uh, that said, great is all around once again. But, Thomas, you will be getting the three on this one, Jeff the two, and Daniel the one. Of course, this is an all-star panel, though, so no one should <laughs> hang their heads. <laughs> As the baseball team looks ahead to their big matchup against Oakey Light, the softball team finds themselves looking back on the wrong end of a sweep against those very same dirt burglars from Stillwater. <laughs> this was a disappointing result for a team coming off consecutive wins against Oklahoma and Houston. So, panel, who needs to be held responsible for Texas softball's recent woes? In this one, we are starting with Jeff. Dirt burglars. <laughs> Are you alright if I steal that? Yeah, can I, can I steal that and put it on a broadcast one? Absolutely. That's I'll, awesome. As long dirt as you send burglars. A clip on Twitter, please. <laughs> I will. And what they'll they'll take royalty fees too. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I'll get my best people on that, then we'll negotiate. But I, I think, I mean, I think you got to start at the top here with with Mike White, and I'm going to say this too. They hadn't been to a Super Regional, I think, since 2013 when they went to the Women's College World Series. Um, so it's not like he's doing a, a poor job or anything, but he was hired to take them from good to slightly above average to great, and they just haven't really done that yet. I mean, winning the one game against Oklahoma, snapping a, what, 20-something game losing skid, eight-year losing streak against them, that was great, but then you can't come out and get swept by another top-five team the next week after that. So... I think it's got to start with Mike White, but like I said, that said, he's still done a good job. He just hasn't necessarily taken them from good to great and championship caliber yet. Absolutely. You know, after that incredible win, not, not just snapping Texas' huge loss, uh, losing streak against Oklahoma, but also Oklahoma's historic winning streak themselves, we were discussing on the show what this meant for Texas, if they would be able to parlay it into future success, and so far it just hasn't been the case. That said, though, Daniel, we're coming to you next. I, I don't like to correct my former boss and Jeff Barker, but <laughs> softball actually made it to Tuscaloosa Super Regional Ooh. in 2019 and, no, the no, 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 no. and the Stillwater Super Regional last year. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they They've made, made it, it there. They yeah. haven't won it. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah, but yeah. but um, um, I, I, I'm probably I mis mistaken what you said. But, yeah, they haven't won a yeah. Super Regional in a while, and they haven't been back. But if you – I mean – you beat Oklahoma, you ask every softball team in the nation, if you beat Oklahoma one, one time during the season, is it a successful season? Most people would have said yes. But I look at the defensive woes at Stillwater. Their defense they, is so leaky that it really became the final hurdle for Oklahoma State to take over. I'm looking at B Megan Bartlett, who's, who, who's the mastermind behind this defense, and this defense is just not reliable. And that has been the killer for this, for this squad for the last season. Um, and that's really what caused a lot of their losses recently. This is true. It, it's a similar, it's a very familiar song and dance hearing about that defense. And it especially showed itself in this last series where it, not only was it a sweep, it wasn't even particularly close. That said, Thomas, we're going to round out this question with you. Well, I think the interesting thing to me is where this team has struggled all season has been the pitching. They've struggled. They, the, the bats have been hot. It's kind of been like Texas baseball, but then all of a sudden this series, and it's ironic as you're going up against Miranda Ellis, you know, your former ace, you're going up against her, and the pitching actually did its job, not giving up more than, what, three runs in a single game, but the bats f went cold. And so I think, you know, hopefully if they can, you know, going forward keep the pitching good and then have those bats heat up, I think they'll be fine. But I think that for me is kind of the craziest thing is what happened in between – the OU series where the pitching was bad, the batting was good, and then it flipped for Oklahoma State. Absolutely. You know, you need consistency if you're going to make your way through a long season like college softball. That said, once again, great consistency with the merit of our answers, everybody, because once again, actually mirroring the first question, Jeff, you'll be getting the three. Thomas and Daniel, once again, you've tied for the two. I swear I don't like giving out ties this often. <laughs> We've got to take a quick break, but when we come back, it's time for some NBA playoff talk. You won't want to miss it. Welcome back to College Crossfire, but before we get started, let's take a look 
at the scoreboard. Leading the show, we've got Jeff with eight points. Coming in close in second, we've got Thomas with seven. And bringing up the rear, we've got Daniel with five. A lot Good of game job. left, and so of course, <laughs> anyone's game. So let's just jump right back into it. Round one of the NBA playoffs is just about winding down, and it feels like the field in recent years has opened back up a bit from the notorious super team era of the 2010s, and as such, this year's bracket has already produced some unexpected results. In the interest of not stealing any of our panelists' points, since there's a limited sample of pool to pick from, <laughs> which series have you found to have been the most surprising thus far? And this one, we are starting with Daniel. I, I, I got two going, and one is, uh, uh, you know, like you said, th this is totally a, sig a signal to the end of the era when Brooklyn gets swept by the Celtics. I didn't expect <laughs> them to, I didn't really expect them to win, to be honest, but to get swept in the manner that they did. But I, I'm a Yankee fan, so I'm kind of rooting for the Nets, and also KD is there, but, but that was about as embarrassing of a team um, coming out, with what, all the drama that they went through this whole season and then gets, getting swept by the Celtics. It's, it's really bad. And the other one, I, and this hasn't ended yet, but if the Sixers bl blow that 3-0 <laughs> lead, and there, it's looking like it, right? Well, you know, Pressure picks up more yeah, and more every time yeah. you lose another hey, one. Of those again, as a games. Yankee fan, I've been there, and I've seen it before, and this looks very similar to that. And so um, I got two going on. I, I still haven't been able to pick one. But both, both teams, both involve James Harden to some, to some degree in this season. Um, doesn't look good right now. Yeah, and you know, I'll just go ahead and say, if the 76ers lose this next game, there is a 100% chance yeah. that they that they that, you know the comeback is completed. Yeah. So very interesting to see, and I'll go ahead and agree with you about the Brooklyn series. Your reasons are why I enjoyed watching it so much. <laughs> uh, but that said, I also enjoy hearing answers from our second baseman <laughs> Thomas. We're on to you next. Well, I was gonna I was gonna say two series, but if you take two and I take two, we're not leaving Jeff with two minutes. <laughs> hey, that's all right. I, 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 I stole your point on one of the questions earlier. I'm, I'm not afraid to do it again. <laughs> I'll just go with, with the, the Phoenix Suns and the, the Pelicans. I really didn't. Obviously, the Devin Booker injury pl has played a lot into that. But I, I even thought, even without Booker, I didn't think the Pelicans were going to have a chance. And obviously, adding C.J. McCollum at the trade deadline was a key piece. But they've had so many other guys step up. And I didn't think that they were going to take the fight to the Suns. And now the Suns are, are fighting to, to stay alive in the playoffs. So, for me, that's been the biggest surprise. Absolutely. And not to put you on the spot, but do you think the Pelicans complete the upset? I don't, but I, I think it goes Game Seven. Ooh, I think it goes. If Game Seven was in New Orleans, the Pelicans would have won because they like the games that have been in New Orleans have been incredible. But I think I think Game Seven in Phoenix, I think the Suns take it there. I'd have to agree with you, sadly. But that said, you're <laughs> right already. <laughs> <has been>. so, <laughs> can we get a little biased? I'm so disappointed. <laughs> I'm so disappointed, but I agree with you, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> that said, Jeff, we're on to you next. I'm surprised no one threw this one out there yet. I was the last one to answer. It's got to be Mavs Jazz, right? Yeah. Surprising. The, the Lucas, Jazz have been such a dumpster fire. But Luca, <laughs> if you said before the series that Luca's not going to play till well, Game okay. Four, I'll give you that. Yeah. And they were going to be up two-one going into Game Four. I mean, I don't know. That would have surprised. That wouldn't. That wouldn't surprised you guys Luca's at all. No, so. I agree. I find it pretty surprising. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's overrated. But you didn't, you didn't think that that Jalen Brunson was going to yeah, you know yeah. throw no, up a I'll throw up a forty that. spot that yeah. game. But but knowing just that the chemistry on the Jazz has been so bad this season, that's what doesn't surprise me. That's true, and they have kind of disappointed, you know, left and right whenever they get in the playoffs. So, but I, I still think that one. If you had said Luca's not going to play till Game Four, he's injured, he may not even come back, and then he does, and going yeah. into Game Six, you're going to have a chance to close it out up three two. That would surprise me. And then one B's, I'm going to steal uh, D Man's <laughs> answer here. I mean, the Nets, the Nets getting swept. Yeah. Like, you know, and th this is not against KD, and I'll just leave it at this. I took a little bit of pleasure in watching. <laughs> 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 didn't, didn't hate it. <laughs> no, and I'll agree. I personally wouldn't have picked the Jazz as the most surprising answer. That said, though, I look at I look at this roster all year, and sure things have been disappointing, but it seems to me somewhat something a team that's in the position to really compete in the next two years now. If they can't if they can't seize this opportunity against the Mavericks, yeah. they threw you a break when yeah. their best player gets uh, injured, all world yeah. player. It's maybe premature, oh, but if yeah. you're the Jazz and you really it's contender or bust, it might be time to blow it up. Mm. That said, Thomas, you blew it up with this question. <laughs> Did not feel like pressure to keep doing the punch. <laughs> <laughs> that said, Thomas, you will be getting the three on this one. Daniel coming in with the two, and Jeff with the one. 
Well, as the postseason in the NBA marches forward, many fans of college baseball are looking ahead to their sport's biggest time of the year. Some obvious contenders in the rankings right now, such as Tennessee, Oregon State, and Miami. And then on the other side, you've got some ball clubs who we thought were worth their salt, but have proven otherwise, uh, such as the so-called flagships over in Mississippi. <laughs> but the real game, where it takes the real analysis, is looking across the board and finding the diamonds in the rough. So, panel. Which team that's currently flying under the radar do you see having the potential for an unexpected deep run in the postseason? And on this one, we are starting with Thomas. So my surprise pick really shouldn't be a surprise pick because they're a college baseball uh, blue blood. I they started in the going. top five. You know where this is going. <laughs> the Vanderbilt Commodores, who started off top five team and have slipped down, have really struggled this season. But you look at this team, there's so much talent. There's so much depth. And you have a coach like Tim Corbin who's been in uh, to Omaha in the College World Series so much. If they get there and they get things clicking at the right time, I wouldn't want to face this Vanderbilt team. That's exactly what I was thinking. There's certainly not a team that you would want to find yourself matched up against in the postseason. Sounds like a recipe for disaster if you find yourself a contender. I said, Jeff, we're on to you next. I'm going to say Texas State. No! Oh, did I steal your no! answer? Didn't I? <laughs> There's so many to pick I want to go. Oh! Oh, no. so yeah. sorry, Daniel. I, I just think that they're, they're one of those mid-major teams that you see, um, you know, benefit from, you know, camaraderie, guys staying and all that, and, and kind of a team gelling and, and really knowing its uh, knowing itself and all that. So I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Texas State, and I think they did benefit a little bit from some of the guys that got an extra year because of COVID that actually came back. They hit really well too. Uh, they kind of went through their little skid, um, and they've, they've overcome that. I think they're on a nine-game win streak now. So. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say I'm gonna steal D-Man's answer and say Texas State. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the extra year we're seeing this across multiple college sports. You are seeing the mid-majors sort of shorten that gap, you know, mm -hmm. between them and the sports really elite. And that's yeah, because there's more experience. These guys have been on the rosters longer. That said, Daniel, before we get to your answer, I don't officially <laughs> penalize for giving an answer that someone else already gave. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was gonna go with the Texas State Bobcats from the great city of San Marcos. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I feel like. Again, with, with all the points that Jeff mentioned, and also all on top of points. the fact, great, <laughs> great points, and on, on top of the fact that they play Texas, they went one and one with them. Uh, when you're when you're a mid major, and you know one of the things that work against you in the playoffs in the postseason is you're playing in that great atmosphere, that big time with a bunch of fans on top of you, and you're not really yourself. Texas State has proven that they can go toe to toe with Texas at home. And on the road, they actually beat Texas in Austin. So um, that is a huge confidence boost, and they're going to carry that to the playoffs, even if they're not hosting a regional. I think that experience can benefit them a lot. They, they just need two wins going to the Super Regionals. Um, the other hand, though, the Purdue Boilermakers. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> the Purdue Boilermakers. Tell they, me about them. What, are, what, are they, what are they ranked? They are not ranked. Oh. <laughs> but they have it. Yeah, 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 right. For Iowa. Right, but they, if they, they have a series with Michigan coming up, and they do well in that one, they're going to put themselves on the map. You only need to, you know, you have to make it to the top 64. And if you're a Big Ten team, you're above average. You do really well, and you do really well in the conference tournament. You can make it there, and hell, hell breaks loose when you're in the tournament. So. Lifelong Boilermaker fan, come checking in right here. <laughs> well, Daniel is a lifelong Boilermaker fan. I appreciate, I appreciate your answer. That said, both of you guys, I feel like Texas State, basically any team where, you know, when you find yourself lined up against them, you go, who's that? Where are they? I've never yeah. heard of that school before. These are the true under-the-radar teams. That said, Jeff, I found your answers to be the most convincing on this one, so you'll be getting the three. Daniel, you're going to take the two. And Thomas, the one. I should have known Vanderbilt can't win this. <laughs> Why was that answer going to win? <laughs> uh, we've got to take another break. But when we come back, it's going to be for all the marbles. Because up next is Rapid Fire. You won't want to miss it. I think a year before ours. Ooh, welcome back to College Crossfire. Let's take a look at the scoreboard once again because the game has tightened up. Still leading the way, we have Jeff with 12 points, but Thomas is hot on his heels with 11. And Daniel, <laughs> coming in close still with the potential to win, is at 9 points. Mathematically, it is anybody's game. <laughs> Which, of course, means it's time for Rapid Fire. And as we say every week, even when it's not mathematically true, it's Rapid Fire, which means it's everybody's game. game. <laughs> which, so that means you could just give someone like 20 points and they win? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Oh, man. I gotta First, it's like the NBA. It's like the NBA. The regular season don't matter. <laughs> it's not that I'll give 20 points. It's that, you know, 
We lie about it. <laughs> <laughs> After what feels like years of waiting, Texas sports and the greater Austin area are finally saying goodbye to the famous, or infamous really, if you look at it from the outside, Frank Irwin Center. And hello to the, and hello to the state-of-the-art new Moody Center. Now, the Frank wasn't just defined by athletics, as an all-star roster of artists came through to host their concerts at the venue. Hopefully, Austin's shiny new bubble can continue this legacy. So, <laughs> panel, what artists would you like to see play at Moody? Anyone can jump in. I know a very close friend of ours, TSTV Sports. He's been here a couple times. <laughs> freshman, I mean, during my freshman year, he was with us for a couple semesters that the god, the goat, Arya Bustami. <laughs> he deserves... <laughs> He deserves, he deserves a concert, and he deserves, he deserves to have one at Moody, at the Moody Center. And, I mean, he's, he had ties with CDC, right? So let's make it happen. You know, I think, I think Beebs is playing tonight. Yeah. You, know, you guys just want to, we can walk yeah. across the street. <laughs> and we, we can, go, we can we call can a see cab. Ju yeah, we call can. Call a cab. Yeah, and right. yeah. Oh, yeah. Here, okay, oh, here we go. Oh, God. Here we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, well, if it was my junior year, we could have called an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And we would have been in the uh, pilot program. But, you know. um, I'll say, uh, you know, no longer with us, but I'm going to say Prince. Mm. Prince would have been, now I really sound old, but. <laughs> Oh gosh. I mean, I feel like at this point saying his name is just controversial, but you can't say that Kanye West is not an incredible performer. And it's kind of been a while he's done like the weird like album release parties, but I would love to see like Kanye West on tour, get him in the Moody Center, have the elevated stage. I want to see that. Absolutely. The fun with Kanye is he's going to put on a great show, and then there's always the chance that we get to see his next crazy thing. <laughs> That's right. Now, Daniel, can you repeat your answer for me? Arya Bustami? Is this someone who went here? I think this is, a, is this like an inside joke? No, so he was, so during, during our, friend, so he's a rapper. He did the rap for, he was rapping for Texas football for a, a one year, for 2018 or 2019? TSTV alum. And then he was, he's a TSTV oh, alum. And we, we were here, we were here our freshman year. He hosted and then, you know, we, we were hanging out until he got famous and he ditched us. But <laughs> <that's the end. laughs> didn't Tom Herman ask him to do a rap? Yeah, he yeah, did yeah, rap for yeah. UT. And yeah. Well, to make everybody feel old, I was still in high school when this man's legacy was being written. <laughs> that said, Daniel, yeah, by a wide margin, it seemed like the biggest crowd pleaser in the room. So for that, I am happy to give you the two on this one. Moving on, UT San Antonio has taken a page out of Tom Herman's Galaxy Brain playbook, debuting what they call the Roadrunner Hydration Chart. It may seem strange, but UC, U UTSA did take home their first conference title last season. People are always going to talk, but I'd wager most of the naysayers are, let's say, juiceless and useless, as you can see <laughs> on the chart. Oh my god. It ain't weird if it works, folks. So what notable figure in sports do you think has a similarly out-of-the-box and possibly affected method of coaching or training? Anyone can jump in. First of all, if, if you're if you're an eight on that, that's that is that's problematic behavior. Like like I don't necessarily agree with the chart. I think that's a bit much. But yeah, if if you're a seven, I'll even say or an eight, you need to get it together. But I, I could I could see Bill Belichick doing something like that. Oh yeah, you know? I bet. I don't I don't know what I don't know what he does, but I could see him having some crazy out of the box idea like that. Maybe that's been the Patriot way all along. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I love, you know, the, the classic thing is Herschel Walker doing ballet and obviously transitioned so well to the football field. But I think you can't argue with the TB12 method right now. I mean, Tom Brady's, what, 43, 44 yeah. years old and still being a top three quarterback in the league. I, I don't want to do it because I've heard it's like, no carbs and a lot of like tomatoes, <laughs> avocado ice cream. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna pass on it. Maybe when I'm 40, I'll pick it back up. But it seems to be no, working you're really no, you're, well for you're, you're, No, you're not. <laughs> you can try, but you're not going to. Let's be honest. Look, yeah, winning conference A is one th uh, is one thing for UTSA, but Brady winning Super Bowls from the retirement home, it, absolutely, <laughs> it's effective, yeah. folks. Daniel, I uh, coaching. I mean. I mean, I'm not going to get any points because as, as, as a coach that nobody, not nobody in this room knows, but a baseball coach in Taiwan, he would ask their cleanup hitter to bunt, and and if you don't bunt, you're, you're getting pulled. And I think, uh, and I think that is a, I think that that is an interesting way of managing an effective way actually, because he actually did win, go out and get a three peat in the Taiwanese league. So I think it shows that nobody is above the team. 
you ha you got to do what's best for the team. And if you're a cleanup hitter, you still got to learn. You still got to train how to bunt, how to make sure that you know your contributions is no less than other, and, than others. So um, there's another team th in the same league that did the exact opposite. And right now they're the worst team in the league because some of the old guys, some of the better guys that used to be great. They're, they're still batting cleanup and they're not hitting well, but they're not getting pulled. And um, that team's doing bad. So I think, is, you know, they're, they're good in bad ways with old school and new school, but um, he, he's got a three peat. His, his name is uh, Daddy Hung. We call him Daddy Hung. And, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, he's, he's got a three peat, so he, he knows what he's doing. So you're telling me Murphy Steely should be buttoned yeah. <laughs> every at bat this say. weekend against Oklahoma hey, State? Hey, look, if it wins, it wins, man. Uh, Co no, Coach win. Pierce better not do that with the <laughs> 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 I, mean, right. I think it's okay to let those guys I, mean, I know you're hitting yeah. like two home runs a game. Yeah. Let's think yeah. of the team here, okay? Bunt it how, down the line. How sick would a bunt sing yeah. here? Exactly. Unless it's one of those Twitter videos where it's a bunt and then it cuts to a home run. <laughs> yeah. No, this is absolutely true. Something I think you guys really got about it as I. <laughs> Dang it. Too late. As I said, you know, it ain't weird if it works. And that said, Thomas, you're going to be in the points on this one because Brady is not only the most notable winner playing right now, he is also the person most notable for strange, somewhat yeah. secretive <laughs> training. <laughs> Absolutely. we got one more to go, fellas. Well, 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 look who got swept. That's right, the Brooklyn Nets couldn't manage to win a single playoff game after an entire year of excuse-making from many in the NBA community, specifically from Brooklyn often about their lackluster regular season. This was a historically disappointing result. I mean, I mean, David, Daniel, you know, you harped on it earlier and you were right. Historically disappointing result, but how does it stack up to the most disappointing teams in history? Let's see for ourselves. Panel, what is your pick for the most disappointing team of all time? This can be across any sport. Anyone can jump in. Any team that has the Texas A&M logo is a disappointing team. Oh. Oh. It's over. So, <laughs> it's <I> mean, your <laughs> winner. <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a confession here, and I know that, that this is really not disappointing for this team, but I grew up, I grew up a USC fan, and I was there at the 2005 National Championship game, and that team – not completing the uh, three-peat or the two-and-a-half-peat, whatever you want to call it, the <laughs> shared national title in 2003. You guys were like four. Don't worry about it. You know, I was there. In the Google right it. color. Yeah. <laughs> were you even old enough to remember that? Barely. <laughs> I was like, I wasn't even that old for that. But, but I'm going to say that was the, you know, I can brag about it now, but that was the most disappointed I've personally ever been. So. Absolutely. I, you know, I remember just a general sense of things feeling right in the world. You know, the Texas was winning. <laughs> that said, though, yeah, it's not a failure of a season, but they were this close from being crowned. Like, people were ready to call them the best yeah. team in college football history. So and that is definitely great. not the same as the Nets, but it's just what popped <laughs> yeah. So part of me wants to say OKC when they had, oh, yeah. you know, Durant and Westbrook and Harden all there, but... I think the most painful moment as any sports fan has to be the Buffalo Bills after that fourth Super Bowl loss in a row. Obviously, wasn't alive then, but I cannot imagine back to back to back to back Super Bowl losses. That's brutal. Losing a championship is one thing. Losing a second championship. <laughs> <laughs> Losing the third my, one is another thing. My Dodgers got got pretty close to that a couple of times <laughs> until they finally won one. Uh, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? What? Is it Asterisk one, you mean? <laughs> oh, oh, this guy. But well, your saying. team showed up and tried to win. <laughs> yeah, just but, didn't. Yeah, but we, I would put an Asterisk next to a 60-game oh, season, that, too. That is not true. Look, but so the Astros have a bigger asterisk on theirs, so I'll give you that one. You could have, y'all should have won. Y'all should have won 2017. I'm disappointed them in a different way, morally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that said, Thomas, for the fact that your team not only once, twice, three, no, four times, and the added element that ever since they have done nothing notable, they don't have a single Super Bowl to their name. I don't think anyone can top the Buffalo Bills, and therefore no one is going to top you for this answer. Thomas, you are going to be taking home the points is that your team? and the win. Is that your team? No. So great work, everybody. That said, Thomas, take it away because it's time for FaceTime. Oh, boy. Um, I was not prepared for this, as you saw in the intro. Clearly winning on college crossfire is not my thing. So we're just going to avoid the, the topic of Trinidad and Tobago. And here's what I'm going to talk about because I haven't been able to talk about sports for a while. But a couple months ago, I'm a Washington, formerly Redskin, now Commander fan. 
I mean, could they have thought of a dumber nickname than the Commanders? I mean, <laughs> football team, which was already a horrible nickname, is still better than Commanders. I could create a better team name on, like, create your own team, Madden, whatever. The Commanders, the logo isn't anything. A Commander isn't anything. You could have done Generals. You could have done Red Hawks. Or just stuck with the football team. But you had to go Commanders. It's not much better than the Cleveland Guardians, but I just, I'm so frustrated by it. And I'm like, do I switch my allegiance? Maybe I'll go to the Bills now. <laughs> After this this momentous win for me. I think knowing your, your, your luck as a fan, they probably won't That's want true. to. That's true. It's probably it's my fault. It's not their fault. Yeah, we, we have room on the Raiders bandwagon. Yeah. You know, but if you're going to bring bad juju, then I'm going to skip the Raiders. You know, the worst and most true thing I've heard about the commander's name is it sounds like the name of a team that the main characters in a sports movie would beat in the championship. <laughs> so true. Well, honestly, I'd take that because we'd at least be in the championship. <laughs> it hasn't happened in a long time. <laughs> that said, fellas, so being that this is a special alumni episode, we ha I have been asked to do a special last question, just oh. as a little bonus for everybody. Anybody can jump in with your favorite memories from working at TACB Sports. Oh, man. Oh, man. I should have seen that coming. <laughs> yeah. I think they do this every one. <laughs> See, their stage director came up and said it right next to me. I'm surprised you couldn't yeah. hear it. <laughs> that's, that's tough to pick one memory, but... Um, I mean, you guys saw my my horrible first moments of this show uh, when I was like, oh, this is college crossover. No, I'm going to pee my pants. <laughs> so I, I think moments like that were probably my favorite memories. And then also the stuff behind the scenes of like coming up with the questions, working with the producers, you know, and then just doing the show and hanging out with my friends. So. I think. Aww. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> he's, yeah. he's getting the points now. I didn't imagine. <laughs> well, I already lost. <laughs> oh, you know, over. Yeah, nothing to lose the now. Trophy away from me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Mr. Washington Commander, no good. <laughs> uh, I think my favorite memory. Twice I got to cover the WGC match play, but the first time I was a freshman. I'm a huge <laughs> golf guy, and I just showed up. No one really told me what to do. I just had a press pass and a camera. And I was like, I want to see Jordan Speed. So I kind of knew he was about to tee off. And so I see some cameras kind of like walking through the tunnel, like next to the tee box. I was like, well, I have a camera too. I'm going to follow them. So I follow them. And next thing I know, I'm standing on number one tee, like five feet away from Jordan Speed. And I followed him, like, literally in the fairway for like a couple holes. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, you have to be on the edge of the fairway. And I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I was like in the shot with Jordan Speed for a couple holes. So that's easily my best memory. Oh, that's incredible. Uh, Daniel? Um, oh, I, I had a joke coming up. Uh, oh, yes. My favorite was Thomas Fitch wearing a blue tie, uh, a green tie during college press box where we literally, it was, it was like... A golf it, tie, not just a, a green tie. It was a golf tie and then it just looked... I think you showed up and then somebody was like, are you sure you're going to wear that? I don't, know how, I don't know how we didn't stop you from doing that. Yeah, for everyone watching at home, the show is filmed uh, in front of a green screen called yeah, Press Boxes. Press Boxes. Is so. is well, do you remember why I wore the golf tie? It, you're covering the Masters for like 17 minutes and on no. one show. No, 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 no. The first golf tie... I was covering Texas recruiting, and I said, it was Nick Kuholtz asked me the question. I said, Nick, I wore this tie because this class was a hole-in-one. And there was a video for Master oh. Control of them, like, filming me because I guess they knew it was coming. And everybody just booed. It's, like, my favorite video ever. All right, but my actual one. Sorry, sorry about that. that. Sorry about that. But, I got um, that. Um, uh, it was Interning with CBS Austin. Well, that's not from, oh, from TSTV, gosh, though. Right. But getting the opportunity to. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, my first year, uh, I was covering the NCAA women's first and second round. Um, and that was just, like, hands down, one of the best, best experience um, that I ever had. But the, the cream on, what is it, cream on the Sunday or cherry on cream, top? Cream of the crop. The, the, the cherry on top is the yeah. fact that at, after the second round, it was like a Monday, it was like 10, 11, everybody wanted to go home. Um, and uh, it was the post-game press conference. We, uh, Texas has just beaten Arizona State. And it was Brooke McCarty and Arrowed Atkins' last game at the Frank Irwin Center in Austin. And then um, I somehow had the courage, I was a freshman, I somehow had the courage to raise my hand and ask a question to um, the seniors. And um, I had a huge celebrity crush on Brooke McCarty at the time. <laughs> and she looked, and, the, and she's, I mean, they're, they're, they're super nice people, and they look, at, they look you in the eyes when they answer questions. And then she was looking me in the eye when she answered questions. In my, in, you know, in my head, I was like, calm down, calm down. In my heart, I'm like, oh, my God, Brooke McCarty <laughs> is looking at me. Am I, like, am? And, then, and then, you know, we obviously, like, Jeff, you know, like, we, after those games, night games, you go, like, when you leave the stadiums at like 10, 30, 11, I was like, you know what? 
I might have it 9 a.m. tomorrow, but it's all worth it. Brooke McCarty looked at me in the eyes. <laughs> he, she looked at me, and then, um, yeah, until this day, I, I cherish that memory. Falling in love at a press conference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cherished memories. I think that's a lovely way to end this special episode. I want to thank you all for coming out and joining us for this alumni edition. I'd like to thank everyone in studio and master control and all of you at home for watching tonight's episode. Don't forget to follow us on social media at TSTV Sports on Twitter and Instagram. Be sure to wake up with the 1 0 Sports Show live Friday mornings at 10 a.m. And join us next week for our semester finale and the special senior episode. See you, see you next week. For all the panelists, everyone in studio and master control, I'm Drew Jacob. Have a wonderful evening.